I think I like Trump. He seems cool. What? But a lot of Americans, they don't listen. They talk a lot, but they don't listen. Do you think you would give your own kids freedom and gaslight them? Oh, I don't want kids. There's so much responsibility. And I was like, oh, like, do you want to have kids? And she was like, no way. Have you looked at the outside world? <laughs> I'm like, oh. I sound like your friend. Okay. <laughs> if you're already struggling to like protect yourself, is a partner in the vision? I think I don't want to be a burden. Let's say hypothetically we get married. Yeah. How did it feel to not have that unconditional love and have that be missing? And do you think it'll be hard for you to sort of ask him finding answers into your already packed schedule? No. You probably manage. Yeah, what's your favorite part of hosting podcasts? Are you going to do more cosplay stuff? I know there's like a lot of cosplays. Is that going nice? Do you watch anime? I do. What's your favorite three? I really like Attack on Titan was really good. Okay, okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What's that anime where you go into a game and then they're stuck in their game? Sword Art Online. I really love season one. I, I broke off my headphones. Did you see that? I was like... Hello. Hello. You're How funny. are you? I'm good. I know your name is just Toxic Bunny. Um, is that sort of like... I don't know your real name, unfortunately. <laughs> um, do you need my real name or is it okay to be anonymous? It's okay to be anonymous. For the podcast, I normally stay anonymous. That's that's totally fine. Do I just call you like bunny, toxic bunny? What, what sort of usually you prefer? Whatever you prefer. <laughs> uh, nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Where are you from? Uh, I am currently in Canada, but I'm from the US. That's awesome. Yeah, I think how I came about you, I think I was like going through like Instagram. I was like scrolling through Instagram. I was on the explore feed. I was looking to bring on some creators and I saw your page into like photography, storytelling. You've grown your sort of socials. You do a bit of streaming. So I was like, oh, I'd, I'd reach out, see if she's interested because I want to sort of bring in some younger sort of content creators. So thank you for taking the time to do this. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. So I guess, could you give the audience and me maybe a bit of context on sort of who you are and sort of what you currently focus on and, and the things you do? I know all the things I mentioned are a, a small gist of it, but I guess maybe you can give us a more in-depth breakdown. Yeah, of course. Uh, I know that content creators get a bad rep. Um, no, I do not have an OF, but, <laughs> but basically, I guess I started in corporate uh, Amazon. Uh, I was in finance for around two years. Uh, I worked in tech for a little bit, and then I just like during COVID got laid off. Um, throughout the whole process, I already started like a little bit of a journey of documenting every day and then creating content on the side. And I think like it's definitely been really good for my mental health as well as like my current like self-awareness and discovery just learning to make content and just like working for yourself so i definitely think that there's a lot of freedom to freelancing that's why it's called freelancing but it's like a different set of stresses and it's not necessarily for everyone i have friends who work in corporate still and it's like their income bracket is like uncomparable to a new content creator um, but i think it's a really fun journey and it helps you discover and understand yourself a lot interesting what was your journey like in the corporate world like how many years did you work in amazon did you was it just two years how long after you graduated were you working in that space Textbook. yeah so i graduated during covid um so i never actually worked in the office um and i think the reason i got laid off is because i changed to another company that i only worked there for like three months but like layoffs started happening and then you know covid and layoffs and then it's been hard to like find another role but i think i also wasn't really looking because at that point like content creation already had like a little bit of a stable grounding like i was earning enough to survive <laughs> so i was like oh maybe i should just make the full-time transition um of course like try to look for six months for you know unemployment but um at the end of the day i think it was a good decision to stay content creation and then i mostly focus on making instagram content like uh, storytelling and cinematic content so some brand deals there uh, i stream as well currently focused on travel and wellness content and then finally i also do like photography like wedding photography and videography so you're doing friend. everything at once I have a, yeah i have a close friend right now he's sort of in the corporate marketing space um and he's been wanting to sort of do his own thing he's been freelancing on the side for the last two years one or two clients helping them with marketing but it's been very hard for him to make the leap and fully transition over to freelancing or running his own agency. And I have actually like another friend that's sort of in the same situation where 
she works at Google. Uh, she used to work at Google. Now she works at, at Salesforce. And it's because the that, income is too high. You don't yeah. want to give up on the income. I think. <laughs> yeah, it's like golden handcuffs. That that's what they call. Yeah. Thought. How did you sort of build a steady base while working enough to a point where you can just transition over? So okay, I'm I'm gonna clarify. I don't earn as much as I used to. Like. But costs are lower. So I guess what I'm trying to explain is like when you're working in a corporate setting, I was in finance in particular. Um, at least for me, it was not rewarding because it felt like I was working for a big giant and not really contributing to the better society. Like I was in charge of like AWS, like headcount mm -hmm. um, budgeting, which basically means I was meeting with a lot of like L7s about next year's budget. That like puts a huge like strain on like a newly graduate kid's mind because it feels like you're the reason people are getting fired, right? So it kind of drained me a lot because like maybe I'm just too weak. <laughs> I couldn't do that without like feeling like a really bad person. Um, so at the end of the day, like I feel like after leaving that setting, I went to another company for like business analyst and, and then COVID hit, right? Or like it was during COVID, but like the layoff started to hit. So I guess I was kind of forced into a transition, but throughout all of COVID, I was streaming and making content. I started with streaming and then I realized I had to grow and learn photography and video to, I guess, like grow my stream. So it was fun to have a small community to talk about like your every day. And like, it's nice like logging off and having like a group of friends you can talk to. That's how it started. Um, I specialized in wellness content back then. So we basically talked about mental health all night. Um, I have since transitioned a little bit away from that because it's really hard to find brands that want to work with you when you're talking about anxiety and depression. Um, I think it's good that people talk about it, but it's, I don't think our society is ready to hear all of that yet. Um, especially brands that are like, oh, she's talking about sad things. Let's not work with her. Um, so I transitioned to like travel and how that can play a role in like changing up. I guess your mental state, like at the end of the day, it's like wellness, right? It doesn't have to, I don't have to say trigger words like anxiety or depression. I could say mental wellness, mental clarity, right? Um, so it's like trying to transition to be workable with friends, I guess. I changed the topic in question, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's totally fine. So like while you're sort of working at those tech companies, you're streaming, you're taking, I guess you're starting to create stories and photography. Was all the income from that just from donations from your community and did you literally go from zero to i don't know x amount of followers within that year and and during that time you're just talking about wellness stuff and you're able to like and was it what, what type of yeah tell me about that was it just like a stream and you just talk and you read the chat or would you share different videos like how would it work yeah so i used to mostly focus on just chatting um, I actually did horror games and uh, uh, like free therapy basically and like confession streams. Um, so it was like a conversation. The horror games are kind of like exposure therapy. It's like, oh, let me like put you in a very scary situation together so that we bond. Um, <laughs> but that was really fun because I know I, I just did a lot of activities that other people didn't want to talk about, didn't want to do because I guess it put me also in a situation where I could practice being scared in a safe environment. And I kind of played really well with like the wellness talks, uh, especially since like horror is a really good way to like relieve a lot of anxiety and like um, expose yourself to dangerous situations in a safe space uh yeah so that's how it kind of started and then it just kept growing because i knew that i needed to grow my other socials to be able to i guess like get more brand deals um i'm gonna be honest i feel like the whole like content creation world is really gatekeepy uh i had a really bad experience when i first started when like networking um very gaslighty and kind of manipulative like other streamers that I met so I actually self-isolated for around two years as a content creator I didn't make any friends I didn't talk to anyone I didn't I didn't talk to any other streamer I was just like I'm gonna do this by myself I'm gonna grind right so I just like sat down posted twice a day and just that's it I didn't talk to anyone I was like oh I'm too scared to make friends because they're all, all, all really scary um but like this recent year I kind of plateaued on socials uh and then I realized it's I guess I repivoted, focused more on finding brand deals and earning income that way. And then also learning to trust people again and make friends. Cause like once you open yourself up, you realize it's not all bad people. So I, I definitely recommend networking. I wish I did it earlier. I freaked out and closed myself off as an extreme introvert. I was like, oh my God, the world is scary. So I just uh, isolated myself, but don't do that. If you're trying to go into content creation, make friends. Um, 
you need a strong support system and a group of people you could talk about like content with it's really helpful and uh in terms of like income yeah in the beginning it was mostly donations it was mostly like uh support from the community especially since i was talking a lot about like wellness and free therapy i think a lot of really kind people joined the community and um just like followed along the journey uh, i did get some brand deals in the beginning but it was like i was really bad at negotiating so that's what i mean by like you got to make friends because the industry is so gatekeepy when you make friends you can talk about hey how are you pitching to brands like what are you asking for for deliverables like th it's not online you're gonna have to talk to people and find people you trust love it it's pretty cool how like you're an introvert but like you're, you pretty have you have this like outward high sort of energy sort it's of anxiety vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i call it social anxiety that presents itself in the form of like hyperactivity I think I used to do the same thing when I was younger. I think I used to be really shy. I think I was like watching this, like this, it was like a, this YouTube channel back in the day called Simple Pickup. And they used to like pick up chicks, I guess. And one of the You don't sound like... nervous though. Like you're not speeding up in conversation, you know? <laughs> I've gotten really good over the last few years. But I think when I was like in the beginning, I used to like, just the thing was like, you'd say what comes to mind. So I was just saying whatever, I had no filter, um, but then it was sort of better than being shy. Um, and then I think, then I sort of compressed that, like I, I, I kept talking a lot, but it was sort of more sort of focused. Um, and then now I've learned how to just like slow myself down. <laughs> Any advice for nervous, anxious people? <laughs> I think. One thing I used to do a lot is I used to breathe. Like I, if, if I catch myself talking too much, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm getting into... Okay, um, how are you going? <laughs> well, that's smart. Thank you for the advice. I'll definitely <laughs> try that. It's well, hard to remember. Yeah, and you can't, it's awkward to do it mid conversation. So I guess when I catch myself snowballing, I try to like take a step back and just purposely slow myself down. But like when, when I croak and there's like something in my throat at mid sentence and, and that throws me off and then now I'm speeding up talking and then I have to like catch myself and be like, okay, let's just slow down. Oh, I, I've been told I talk really fast. So yeah, that's really good advice. Just like remembering to talk slowly, but that feels so uncomfortable, you know? <laughs> True. Maybe I'm naturally a slow talker. So I think I found what was like naturally my pace. So maybe you're naturally really fast <laughs> at talking. Maybe that's your, that's your balance. Um, I'm trying to think because I'm, I'm born in 99. So I'm like the year of a rabbit. And I, and oh, I you're like, like younger the... than me. Is it? Yeah, I... I'm born in 98. 98. Oh, so you're, you're a tiger. Y yeah. What? Okay, you need to not dress that mature. You need to dress younger. Is it? Is it? You're I'm giving like off TV. like older vibes. <laughs> Is it? Oh, that's. I used to wear a lot of like baggy clothes, like hoodies. I used to like be like into like the whole Supreme Palace Bape sort of. Oh, um, okay, yeah. Set up, but then I don't know. Like I sort of like grew out of it, I guess. Mm. I just like pastel colors. It Is throws it? people off. They're like, "How old are you?" I'm is old. That, what's is that like beige and like is that I like gray tones. I don't know if that like Yeah, my room is basically the content creative powers. <laughs> this, is, this is our superpower. Purple. This is our superpower. Purple. We can we could do this. Nice. <laughs> yeah, this is my only superpower. Um but yeah, it's like pastel colors are like this color. Oh, got it. So like I was completely thinking of like sort of more dull colors like, but pastel colors like kitty colors it's like sort of what, yeah, like, yeah yeah like baby colors like, like slightly coloring. whiter it's like a water coloring set yeah <laughs> yeah yeah a hundred percent it's like that's my favorite fun. color scheme um so what's your main thing you do now do you do you do a lot of streaming is it like instagram um what do you split your time between everything like what what do you do now Honestly, I am very like OC about my time. I think I'm really bad at time management, um, mm. but I would say I stream three to four times a week um, and I kind of transitioned to like IRL streaming niche, which is like 
travel going outside taking them outside to explore i think it helps their mental health especially since my community is more introvert heavy they don't like touching grass you know gamers don't want to go outside but they want you to go outside so they don't have to go outside so sharing new experiences um sharing the world with them through my lens that's like around two out of four streams per week and then the rest is focused on wellness so like free therapy confession booths um kind of to give them an opportunity to talk about what they're struggling with i personally really enjoy that so i was talking to my parents about going back for an md for so uh psychiatry they were like like why and i'm just like i don't know it's interesting um but yeah that's what i mostly do on the streaming side and then I my dog recently passed away, so I haven't been really good at posting, but I used to post daily. Um, so it's like once a day, uh, usually in the evening times. And it's like travel, like wellness related content, like how to deal with like, you know, different types of stressors or like ways to like de-stress on the weekend um, and like where I would go to like. I guess for a reset, mental reset, talking about like different topics, like trying to tell a story, talk about mental wellness, but like not make it like a trigger for brands basically. So once a day, and then I mostly post on TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram. Do you do a lot of um, outreach for brands or is it like inbound or do you like every day you try to pitch a brand? What's sort of like the main routine? So I'm one of those like, um, if I throw 10, like if I throw 10 of these like darts, one of them will hit the center sort of people. But yeah, I I haven't been recently because this month I've been kind of just giving myself some time and everything. But usually I would say around 50 brands per week. Uh, so I do outreach, but I also like some come in, uh, they might not always be a good fit when they like have offers though. So I tend to also do outreach at the same time. I think it's a good balance because when you're outreaching you're aiming for brands that you think would be a good fit to you and then if they reach out to you it may or may not be a good fit so it's like certain like games might reach out to me but then i don't really play mobile games so it just depends on if i feel like it's a good fit because another big thing about content creation is you kind of have to build trust right and so if you're working with every single brand that comes in sure you can earn a couple thousand dollars here and there but like then you're just kind of a sellout so at least for me, I try to target brands that I think I can speak for or I think are really cool. Maybe maybe they're they're a bad company at some point and we find out they're like kind of weird, but then I don't feel guilty about it because I like their product. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's reckon, kind of my mindset. I reckon that's your talking pace. Yeah, because it's like, even if they are like they have, they're, they're in backlash at one point, you can still feel like hey but i still like their products or i still like the experience regardless of what other people think yeah because there's backlash about brands all the time especially like political things you know what i mean like maybe they support a certain side that everyone doesn't support but like if the product is good the product is good you can't judge a company for its leadership if their products are good to a certain extent i think that's kind of unreasonable it's like judging america on our political stance Trump ruled for like four years. That doesn't mean everyone's a Trump supporter. I don't know if that's a good way to put it. It's like, you can't judge culture, people, and the government together. So the kind of the same way, I feel like brands should not be judged like that either. Interesting. That was completely random, but yeah. <laughs> Cause our brains, I guess like that comes down to like communication, which is like the biggest and hardest thing to do in reality, like proper communication, right? Cause it's like, I think humans do innately make assumptions and it's not really anyone's fault that we do. But it's like our brains are good at recognizing pattern and making connections. Um, so it's like you might, if it's similar to the topic, you might like unintentionally lead back to it because it's like related to it. I wonder if that's just like pattern recognition. Probably is. So I'm going to take your advice. I'm going to say, <laughs> hey, we're going into a different topic. <laughs> Go back to content creation. <laughs> the point of your podcast, I got you. <laughs> we're going into a different topic. So I'm, I'm applying what you just taught me. So this is no pattern recognition and this different topic is about sort of ego where like what I just did of saying, Hey, that's a good point. I'm going to take that on. I think you're right. I could have improved on that. Let me apply. Let me give you credit. That's something that no one can do. Like that's something that people really, really, really struggle with. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, kind of tying back to like, I think there was one point that relates to content creation that I kind of didn't cover. Um, I actually don't get motivated because like, I feel like I deserve anything, if that's helpful. Cause that kind of ties to like my diagnosis as well. Um, I have OCD. So when I do work, 
I don't do it because I feel like, you know, I need to get somewhere. I do it because it gives me a sense of relief. So if anyone else here struggles with that, it's almost like an impending doom. If you don't get it done, there's an impending doom. So people are like, how are you so productive? Because I'm mentally ill. No, I'm <laughs> it's like, I view it as debuffs, right? Because kind of relating to that, um, ego, I think, is only an issue if you think you're doing enough. Like, I think I can be confident in certain things, like maybe my work ethic. But I think, yeah, you're right. Ego is something you kind of need to let go of when making content in particular because there's always going to be someone better than you you're never going to be big enough and you're never going to be earning enough like that's something you just have to understand like until you get to a point where it's really sustainable there's not much in ego like at the end of the day i know a lot of content creators like feel like numbers matter but like what do numbers matter if you can't earn income from it like what what do matters mean what do followers mean if you can't survive right because there's so many content creators with like an ungodly amount of followers, but they can't earn enough to like hit minimum wage. So at the end of the day, it's about sustainability. It's about grinding. It's about like finding a niche that you like, but also you can find sustainability in to survive. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, ego is a thing when it comes to maybe, I would say most people have ego when it comes to topics they talk about in their education and their knowledge, or, or that's probably an area that's okay. To have ego but especially in the creation world your followers mean nothing there's always going to be someone better than you there's always going to be someone bigger than you not to say that you should be depressed about it because that's also not good but it's like using that as motivation to grow i guess and then push yourself to higher heights yeah yeah but i i think i work hard not because like like oh i deserve a better future no no no. i work hard because it's like impending doom i need to finish all 10 tasks and if i don't oh my lord <laughs> Can I sleep? Do I deserve this? Oh, yeah. So it's, it's, use your mental debuffs as positives <laughs> and learn to work with what you have, I guess. Got it. Different topic, but tied based on what you just shared. What was your upbringing like? Like, was it like having Asian parents doing sports, volunteering, trying to get a good sort of CV, try to get a scholarship at a decent sort of college and university? do things on the side, try to join some societies and then run some clubs, get some scholarships, get use the scholarship and then spin that into some nice tech position. Was that your sort of upbringing? It was like constant like pressure to like get high marks or? That's yeah. a good question. <laughs> um, so I guess I've moved like 10 plus times growing up, like a lot of moves, uh, both in North America and China. Mm -hmm. um and then my upbringing was kind of like my parents actually didn't control me that much it was more like gaslighty it was like oh it's your life and your decisions if you mess up then you pay the consequences which taught me responsibility really young like i had allowance i had budgets you know what i mean and that's probably why i majored in like econ and finance but but <laughs> it's a lot of teaching independence since a young age and then I do think that moving very frequently did impact me a lot growing up because every time you change schools, there's of course this bullying because you're like weird and you're different. Um, so a lot of just like finding myself, I don't think I'm at a point where I'm happy with yet, uh, but a lot of self-discovery because you're alone a lot of times. Um, I feel like I'm quite quirky and also quite weird in a way. Uh, it's cool now, but like I watched anime, I cosplayed. I don't know. I was kind of geeky. I played video games. These are all weird things, you know, growing up that, you know, the kid that sat in the library to read because no one wanted to play video games with her. But yeah, like it's cool now. But like growing up, it was it wasn't a good thing. Uh, but it gave me time to, I guess, like discover myself um, and reflect on the things that happened in my life. So yeah, very free parents. I put most of the pressure on myself um, with them occasionally gaslighting me to get me in the right direction. But most of the schools I went to were international schools, like after middle school, like I, I went abroad. So I was in a lot of international schools uh, and the course load required a lot of like service, uh, IB. I took the IB. I don't know if you guys have that in Australia. Probably, right? No, you don't have. It. Okay. Like it's, I think it's a European model. And then they force you to do like service and sports and art. So I had a lot of that growing up. And I think my mom was very educated for a time in a sense she was like you have to learn how to play first before 
you can learn how to study. So sh I took a lot of random courses, like horseback riding, fencing, uh, I know how to bartend, uh, taxidermy, all the instruments, sports, that's so random, singing. Like, it's, it's like, it's weird. It's a really weird set of like skills. <laughs> when I think of like fencing, horse riding, sort of like traveling from like North America, Canada, China, I think of like some like old family, like succession sort of TV show, but like an Asian version of that vibe, fencing and horse riding. Fencing was at school, horseback riding, because I liked it because my sister was doing it and I wanted to be like cool. Um, I was just a really curious kid, like dance, like I would just get myself in situations where I would learn something new. Um, because I was curious, like I was the kid who asked why like a million times to the point where teachers told me to be quiet. I was that kid, you know, why is the sky blue? Why are we doing this today? Why are we learning about triangles? Is it relevant in the real world? You know what I mean? That kid, um, parent teacher conferences, uh, can you ask less questions? <laughs> but that kind of played a role, I guess, in like my interest in wellness, my interest in understanding like our behavior. Uh, I mostly like specialized in behavioral economics, finance. I loved game theory. So it's like figuring out why people think the way they do. It's just fun, I guess. And then that also probably played a role in the hobbies I chose. Nice. Do you think you would give your kids, your own kids freedom and gaslight them? Oh, I don't want kids. There's so much responsibility. I don't think I can raise healthy children. <laughs> Do you want kids? I want a ton. Actually? I think uh I think a ton is sort of exaggerating, but I do want kids, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm afraid I'll mess them up, you know? <laughs> I remember I was like this I was really shocked. I was at a friend's birthday. We went out to like a restaurant and there was this girl opposite it was his friend, it was his first time meeting, so I just, you know, we're talking and I was like, Oh like, do you wanna have kids? And she was like, no way. I'm like, oh, well, I was like shocked. I was like, how come? Very similar reaction to what you said. She said, have you looked at the outside world? I'm like, uh. <laughs> I what? can't protect them. What? What about the outside world? It's like, the crime rates are so high. Look, at climate change or like, um, like people are being killed. Look, all the wars happening. Like, I don't want to bring a kid into this world. Sound like your friend. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're in that, that section. Okay. Yeah. No, what? I sound exactly like her. I'm, I'm like, how am I supposed to protect them from the outside world? Or at least till they're 18, you know, cause it's your responsibility until they're an adult. I don't know if I can protect children till they're 18, maybe even 16, you know? Have you been to any countries that have worse conditions than the current America? Do you want me to be honest? Yeah. No. Have you <laughs> to any like like bad parts of China, any third world sort of places of China, or have you just been in the main cities? I have been in like more rural places of China. Mm -hmm. Um but I feel like the people's mindset is better. It's not violent, like it's safe. Like I know that the world paints China as like a scary, scary place, but I feel like it's safer than he like there than in the US. And like, I'm constantly, like I'm American, I'm legally American. So I'm kind of stuck in the US. I can kind of only work in the US. Um, I can only like buy houses in the US and I can only stay in the US permanently, but I can travel out, right? Like I've traveled a lot and like, I feel like even Europe is safer. It's not about the color of my skin and like immersion. Like maybe it's like the assumption people are like, oh, maybe it's cause you, you, you look Asian. So you feel safer in Asia. No, 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 no. I feel safer in Europe than I do in the US. Like sure, I might get pickpocketed, but like, it's just the environment's different, you know? Like people you, are more lax. The US, yeah. the least safest place you've been to? And if yes, what's the second? Or how I feel, like, the you know what I mean? second least safest place based on how you feel? Probably Greece. <laughs> Greece was kind of like, I don't know, Greece maybe. Got it. That's so gotta Greece be that bad. Still, still better than than America. 
Yeah. Got it. it wasn't that bad. Because, like, I've been to, like, countries. I've been to, like, Vietnam, Thailand, Mongolia, New Caledonia. Like, those are countries that, like, I'd prefer to live in America at its current state more than those countries. Which state, though? <laughs> Which yeah. state, though? Probably, like, I don't know, like, obviously, like, based on what I'm seeing, it seems like Texas seems like a nice place to live in. Okay, but would you live in, like, the redneck states? You, you know what I mean? Like, would you go to, like, rural America? I have friends that live in, like, um, Nevada, like, near near Las Vegas, but off the strip, like, I don't know, wh that's where? That's not too bad. That's, that's not too bad. That's not yeah, that's, like, a nice area. I stayed in San Francisco for nine months. In 20 Recently? 2019. Oh, okay, okay. That wasn't as bad. It's so bad now. I was like, wait, what? Yeah. But we stayed in like, I was like in this place called Bayview. It was probably roughly 20 minutes away from the city, 10 minute drive away from the San Francisco downtown. And like Bayview, it was like the hood. Like, like it was the first time living like if i felt like i was in like an american movie where like all the houses look run down you see like abandoned cars everywhere you see people loitering you weren't scared i was like yeah i was scared i was okay. scared. <laughs> were you not scared i was scared uh, okay and i was like oh, i used to it over time i was like wow this is really really rough uh, i was like maybe you're like an adrenaline junkie and you're not scared you know Maybe you like the rush. <laughs> like it was definitely, yeah. And then like when I was like scootering around the neighborhood, I, I, I was yeah. definitely on edge. But despite like me experiencing that and experiencing like all those other countries I mentioned earlier that I feel like are worse. So then America and I'd be even more on edge. Like I feel like the world isn't that bad. Uh, well, I'm like really short and I fit in suitcases. So maybe I have to be more careful. <laughs> That's the joke I make. It's just like, I don't know. There's like a lot of, I think women are more likely to get kidnapped than men, right? Is that generally true? <laughs> I don't know if that's like a statistically. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, yeah, I have no idea. But I like in my head, I think I have like a really scary view of the world. It's like, oh, I'm more likely to fit into suitcases and I'm more likely to get kidnapped. So I have to be more hyper vigilant in public spaces. Interesting. So given yeah. that you don't want to have kids because like you don't want to bring them into this. I can't even protect myself, let alone protect children. No. <laughs> Perfect. Off that line. Do you want to find a partner? Like, if, if you're already struggling to, like, protect yourself, like, is a partner in the, the picture or vision? Or is that not even in it because you're just trying to survive and trying to get through this tough life by yourself? And adding another person to the picture is just more problems. Like, I think I don't want to be a burden. <laughs> Got it. Like, I'm, like, hyper right? Like, I have a lot of things I'm struggling myself. I feel like other people also have things they're struggling with, so it's... Especially since I'm freelancing and I feel like I can't be a proper support to someone else. I guess like maybe it's just past trauma and feeling like I'm not enough, but I don't really want to be someone else's problem. And like if I was working a nice cushy corporate job, earning like a nice salary with health insurance and stuff, like I would feel less pressured and probably more comfortable finding a partner. But it's like if I'm not and I'm just freelancing and I'm trying to like fight for a goal i don't feel like i should put that on someone else as well you know and the stresses are going to be different right and i feel like it's hard to be with someone who's not like that you, then you could say why don't you do it in the crater because i feel like that might get t t toxic too you know because it's like you might be competitive um maybe maybe another well, creator yeah. but like you said there is a sense of ego yes. there right I, why would another creator want to be with someone like me Let's say there's like a girl, she's like, say 20, 21. She just finished university. She got like a job, but like, it's just like a job that like, maybe it's like a low, like graduate position at some like firm. That's like maybe not one of the big fours, but it's like right under. She makes like 70K a year. She's like struggling to pay rent or she still lives with her parents. And then she meets a man and she marries the man. She quits her job. She cleans the house, she cooks for him, she relies on him for money to buy clothes and food. 
She looks after their newborn baby and she relies completely on the man. So she's a major burden in your sort of terms, I guess. Is that bad? So my mom was a stay home mom. Um, and I don't think she was a burden per se because, like, she, I think housework is still a portion of, you know, like, if you get divorced, she gets like a certain amount of your income. You know what I mean? Like, if someone gives up all her dreams to take care of you, that's also a job. It's just an unpaid job. Um, but I will say that because I don't want children, so it's not as relevant to me because I could be a caregiver to someone. But like, I don't want to have children, which is probably why I think that's kind of irrelevant to me personally. But also, I guess my mom, because she was a stay home mom, she kind of taught me growing up that try not to rely on someone else for your happiness. Because when you do that, it puts yourself at risk when they change because people can change. And it's not to say that like, you shouldn't trust in your partner. But it's like if you put all your reliance and financial needs on one person, if that person one day doesn't want to be there for you, you have nothing, right? So it's like, it's always better to be the person with that control. Like I would never, like if I was earning more than the person I'm dating, I would never like hurt them purposefully or do that to them because I know how it feels like, right? You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't want to have less because I'm dating someone because then if things change, I feel like I'll be in a very like fatal position. I don't know how to say that in English, like a uh, passive position. Yeah. Would you prefer to be a stay at home wife? You marry like this millionaire guy, but there's a prenup. Mm -hmm. And then it's sort of like you, you can't take half of what he has. Yeah. Or would you prefer to be an independent woman, make your own money, and you marry a husband that's also making his own money and there's no prenup? I would rather marry the normal person. 100%. <laughs> no hesitation. Because like, or I don't even mind like marrying someone with lower income than I do. Cause I could just work harder. Like, I don't really care about a guy's income bracket just cause like I was raised in an environment where like, I think it taught me that money doesn't make you happy. As someone who majored in like finance and money, you know what I mean? It's like, it can't bring you happiness. When I was earning like three times as much as I do now, like I don't, I earn enough to get by. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> but like, Back then I was earning, like, I could save up a decent amount of money, but I feel like I was, like, a shopaholic because I would get off of work at, like, 9 p.m. every day and be really, like, stressed, right? So I would buy so many things to try to fill that void. So at the end of the day, I wasn't really saving much money. I was, what, shopping therapy? It was horrible. Like, I was trying to find a way to fill a void because I was so stressed about work and then I wasn't happy. And my mental state was horrible. I was with someone at the time and they were actually quite toxic because this is completely not related to content creation, but um, he was earning like 30K more than I was because he was a soft dev. And then he made it like his life mission to remind me that I'm not earning an extra 30K. So over I think maybe year? that's- what... Over a year, a whole year? Extra... Yeah, over a year. He earned an extra 30K in total over a year. But I did all the house chores, like all the cooking, all the house chores and everything, right? Um, All the shopping, like everything was me. I drove, he didn't have a driver's license. But like, for some reason, that 30K was a big deal, you know? So I guess like, maybe it's past trauma. I just don't want someone else to have that power over me again. Um, So I guess that's why I like being independent. And I don't know if I'm ready to like have someone in my life yet because I'm not, at an income bracket where I feel like I can support a family or another person. But when I get there one day, I'll, I'll happily, willingly spoil someone to no returns. And then that's good. I would be nice. Please don't earn as much as I do. <laughs> so on the topic of like divorces and if it's fair, if, if the wife should get half of what the, the man makes. Yeah. Hypothetically, let's say we jump five years in the future. Mm -hmm. You are now an independent woman you've met you you can survive on your own you make a decent amount to cover all your expenses and more mm -hmm. and let's say hypothetically we get married yeah if we break up and have a divorce mm -hmm. why do you need half of my millions let's say i'm a millionaire well to be fair that's that's a good point but i guess like let's say that you didn't have a million dollars and i had a million dollars i can always earn a million dollars back so like because because i don't want to use you as an example because you'd be like 
yeah so uh, my logic is this the you've loved this person before you've cared for this person you've spent time together and you've committed that time and you've committed that like you know love to each other at one point right and you gave each other time which is the most important thing in the world so the very least i can do for my partner is to put them in a position where they can run do you know what i mean like sure like maybe things like happen that like ruin the relation maybe like one person cheated maybe they did something to hurt you but in reality you did love this person at one point you were in love with them and i think the least that i can do as a person is to put you in a position where you can still run because you're still going to be grieving you're going to be sad you're going to be going through heartbreak the very least i could do is put you in a situation where you're able to survive on your own because that's the least i can do i think it's just maybe because i see so many people not do that and like when they fall out of love they become so cruel that i don't want to ever treat someone that i love like that that's the least i can do um and if you are a millionaire you are fully capable of earning another million and if you can't where's why is your ego so big <laughs> So let's run the same scenario. Let's say it's five years from now, it's 2029. 20, In your most ambitious goals, how much would you want to be making a year? Toxic bunny. Half a mil? Okay. That's good enough. So let's in 2029, you're making half a mil. Mm -hmm. And I'm making, say, 10 mil a year. And we, we married, we we're together for a few years, and maybe like the numbers stay the same for a few years. And we sort of get a divorce. Mm -hmm. Would you like, like, do you need half of, of my net worth? Or no, what's like, in yeah, in this situation with both people are like capable of surviving on their own. I do agree. You don't really need to split anything. You could give what you choose you want to give. So let's say that we had a dog together and you think that I would be better off with the dog because I'm emotionally more like unstable. I would appreciate that because we've dated for a couple years that you care, or we were married, that you would care enough to leave me with the dog. You know, you know what I mean? It's stuff like that. Like, I think scenario. it's just having, <laughs> you're just like, nah, that's not what I want to hear. <laughs> no, 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 that's perfect. No, I, I, I understood the point. And like, you didn't say, if you said no, then that would have been very interesting. If you're like, of course I'd want more money. Then that would have been- Well, I want the dog. Like, let's say yeah, hypothetically had a dog. Yeah. I want the dog, okay? <laughs> now let's say similar scenario, but when I get married, I'm like, hey, toxic bunny, I want you to, you know, hopefully this doesn't happen. But if we do get divorced, I'd like you to sign this prenup where it says if we get divorced, we're not going to take each other's stuff. How would you respond to it? Would you sign it? What's your thoughts? So it depends on if one person has to give up anything for the other person. So <clears throat> let's say that you're not a millionaire, but you require someone to stay home to take care of your children and to like give up their goals for you, then I think a prenup is unfair in that situation. So if you're like, to a certain extent, limiting someone else's ability to grow, then you should not be asking for a prenup. However, if you're both still capable of being independent and doing your own goals and prioritizing your own goals without asking the other person to do anything for you, then I think it's fair um, that there's no prenup, but usually, one person has to take the shorter end of the stick in a relationship. Just because, like, if you're just going to be independent and do your own thing, then why are you dating? I don't know if that makes sense. Because everyone wants someone to take problem. care of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's get going. Let's say, it's a similar scenario, same income bracket. You're making 500k, I'm making 10 mil. Mm. And then I'm like, let's get married. And I have a prenup. And, and let's say in this scenario, you want kids. You want three kids. We're going to have three kids. And you're going to have to give up your work to raise those three kids. And in the prenup, it says you would get 500K for the amount of, like, we'll do 100 years minus your age. Let's say you're going to live an extra 40 years. You'll get 40 years times 500K when we break up, if that happens. So that's that completely sense. reasonable. Yes. Okay. And then let's say, so that would equate, let's say you have 40 years left. That would be, I'll give you $20 million for the divorce yeah. case. And let's say we get divorced 10 years later and I'm worth $10 billion. That doesn't matter because it's not mine. I'm, I'm sorry. I, just, I don't know. I just, why, why? I'm sorry, just like, it's not mine though. Like we chose different paths. You've like, we've signed a contract on how much you're giving me. I am supporting your three children. You also will have visitation rights, right? It is your children. Let's that take care of them. And you give me 500K per year for 40 years, I think. Or like, however, you're, yeah, 100. Um, I think that's reasonable. And that's more than enough. 
what, $20 million is more than enough for retirement. I, yeah. I don't know. I think people shouldn't be greedy. Like, what are you going to do with $10 billion? Like, Now, let's say this is something I'm trying to, you know, like pitch oh. to my future wife. How would you advise me to do it in a very romantic way? Wait, can you repeat the question? How can I? Well, I guess based on your reaction, you're totally fine. But uh, like, I would have thought if someone, like if, if I handed that to someone, it, I'd had to sell it to them. But based on what I shared, it seems like it's an easy sell. No, Wait, I still don't no. get the question. The question <laughs> my bad. If I had to tell my future wife about this prenup, should I do it in any different way? Is there any nicer no, way? No, 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 no. Oh, I see what you mean. No, no, no. I think it's completely reasonable to bring it up. Like maybe in the earlier times of the relationship, like I'll give you an example. Like we're like similar age, right? We're not like young or anything. I think it's immature for people to hide things like that. I think like maybe the first couple of dates you can bring it up. Like if they're not okay with it, then it's already not a good fit. For example, I view prenups kind of like children. Like I'm going to tell them I don't want kids. And if they want kids, we're probably not a good fit for each other. Mm -hmm. You don't want to change people, their core values and what matters to them. If they change, talk about it when you change your perspective, because that's communication, that's fine. But like, if you already know you don't want kids, you should let people know ahead of time, you know? If that changes, I'll tell you. But like, if you're okay with not having kids and they don't want kids, then it's a good match. If that changes, then talk about it. I think that's really healthy. As well as prenups, like talk about it as early as you can. Yeah. Yeah. I think the reason I asked is because until we sort of went down this rabbit hole, I would have thought you'd be an anti-prenup, like I'm, I'm the woman, like it's only fair I get half of the guys. Like I, I would have thought, and I think most people maybe most women i correct me if i'm wrong maybe feel similar to that but i guess after this conversation you're obviously more open than i thought so yeah. i'll explain um i guess like i don't really like relying on other people that might be the root of why um mm. and i also feel like Generally speaking, I go broke whenever I date a guy. I know that's really uncommon. Like a lot of guys in my chat are just like, that doesn't make any logical sense. I like, I don't like it when guys pay for my things. Mm. I don't like monetary gifts. Um, mm. And I tend to go broke whenever I date a guy. So I think partially of the reason why I'm not, like I don't want to date is because I don't think I have the financial means to spoil someone mm. right now. Like I can't buy you everything I want to buy you. So I don't really want to find someone right now. When I'm capable of spoiling someone like that, I will find someone. Also, it'll give me time to heal my mental state. But it's like, I feel like I'm a little bit more like a dude. I'm also a hopeless romantic. So I just like giving people stuff. Um, yeah, it's weird. That might be the root of why I don't think I need to take anything away from someone unless I give up something. So it's like if I quit streaming to raise your children, I think it's reasonable that the prenup says that I get a certain amount of income to survive after or to restart what I want to restart, you know, but like, it's a reasonable amount. Talking about like mental health, mm -hmm. do you get most of your mental health therapy from just your stream, your content, you talking to viewers, or do you have therapists or older mentors or older friends that you go to? Um, or do you have friends that you talk to every day? What's your, your current mental health sort of routine? Yeah, so I only recently started seeing a therapist. Uh, I used to self isolate and like do things myself very independent, generally speaking, um, because I was afraid that I would like burden people like they're big problems. And I can't even solve them myself. How can I put this on someone else? Maybe it's the gaslighting as a kid, but I was scared of talking to people about it. So I spent the first like what eight, nine years of my like pubescent years uh, not talking to people about it. But during like my time working at corporate, there was like my relationship wasn't going well. It was really unhealthy. Um, work was really stressful. Like I was just in a really bad state. So like it's hard not to have breakdowns sometimes if you're streaming that late at night. So I would have this, these like breakdowns and like, you know, m my community would ask me if I'm OK. And that's what kind of led to Free Therapy Fridays because they were helping me. So I wanted to give back. And so I hosted a forum for them to talk about their problems. And throughout that process, I learned about myself as well as I also like felt like I was contributing, I was contributing positively to the world. So I guess it helped me kind of heal as well. And I kept doing it for like two, three years. Now I do have a therapist, but it's like recent seven, eight months. I finally like have 
I guess, like accepted that it might be helpful to have some guidance. Of course, throughout my life, I had a lot of mentors and like, I'm really good with parents. So I would oftentimes chat with people's parents. So I've had a lot of guidance from older people, but now I have like an actual therapist and it has been the best thing for me ever. So I always recommend a therapist, like a good one, of course, look for a good one. But it's like, I do think that they help guide you. It's like a better life coach really is what a therapist is. Nice. Let's, can we do like a mini therapy Thursday? Obviously you can be the therapist and, and I'm just coming in. This is me sort of putting ego aside and wanting to experience sort of your yeah. thing. Let's do a, like a mini, mini therapy Thursday now. So you gotta, you gotta give me a question. You gotta like say your question and then I can answer it. Okay. So my question right now, Toxic Bunny, is I don't know what the question should be. That's my question. I don't know what to ask right now. <laughs> I guess, do you have any unexplored childhood traumas that you think are causing you impending doom or changing the way you make decisions every day? I think I spent a lot of time uncovering and accepting and really seeing my childhood for what it is and that it really helped me. And like, I, I, I sort of try to look back and try to explore, but I feel like, like it's, it's just, I'm, I'm so grateful for that, that process. And every time I explore, I'm like, oh, I'm like, sort of like, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful for my childhood and my sort of random mixture of ag adversity that sort of led me to where I am. And I don't know. Like, can you, can you help prod, prod that? I feel like that's a pretty healthy childhood, to be honest, like just hearing from it. Did you ever have like any struggles in school or like the way that your parents kind of, I guess, engaged in your upbringing? I guess if I were to sort of go back to old Andy, old Andy would have said things like, you know, my parents split up when I was young. My father was never around. He never financially supported my mother. He sort of went off to do business. In school, I was always really the odd kid out. Like I'd talk to everyone, but I'd never have my own group of friends. So I was quite lonely, even though I had people to talk to, but I was never included. So that felt really bad. Definitely was like a lot of insecurities, but not insecurities, sort of like confusion. Cause I was sort of being myself and people weren't liking me. And that caused a lot of sort of angst. Um, so that's sort of my upbringing. Do you think there's ever like self-worth issues that you're struggling with right now? Like, do you ever feel like you don't deserve what you have or that you have to work even harder to get where you are? Mm, I think maybe initially I was trying really hard to prove people wrong, to show that, you know, all my crazy questions and thoughts weren't crazy. Yeah. The way that all came from my dad and, you know, I, I need to thank my dad for it. But now I'm sort of like, I'm, I'm like just happy with, like I'm happy that I'm doing past any justice. Like I know, like eighteen year old me would would wish to be on this this Zoom podcast with Toxic Bunny and and just chilling and and. Steady. I'm quirky. No, no, no. No, no, no. I mean, in like a grateful way that I can sort of do this for a living, talk to cool, interesting people, like have this set up and and have my own spot. Like that's what I meant. No, not like in a creepy way. Yeah. No. No. no of course. Of course. I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess like you're probably found as you probably found a sense of self-healing throughout like creating like podcasts and content but it is it would be interesting to discover i guess like more and like dig into your past more because it can help like improve the efficiency of your everyday so i guess like discovering yourself this process just makes you more and more efficient it's not that like it needs to be fixed it's not that the way you coped is wrong it just might not be the most efficient way to do so. So it's like finding ways to be even more happy, even more efficient, even more, I guess, like hopeful for the future. It, like you could be in a better mental state than you are now. So it's like, I do think you healed really well though, especially without like external help or therapy. It's like finding out what you struggle with and things that might like the, the, the overthinking, the intrusive thoughts um, and how to handle them. Cause I definitely think that childhood Andy probably had his fair share of trauma um, as well as struggles. So it's like, there might be some that are unresolved and maybe like thinking about those 
intrusive thoughts and where they stem from might help improve the efficiency of your everyday and maybe even make you more happy than you are now. Okay, so me putting my ego aside and me showing that I want to learn, um, can we try do like a mini discovery session where maybe I can optimize and sort of optimize my thing? Can we can we try that now? Oh, kind of just like talking about or prodding more. <laughs> or like, how would I go about? Like, let's say you're a therapist. How do I go ahead and, yeah. and optimize things? I, I want to learn and, and try that now. Yeah. Are there ever like times in your day where you feel like you're maybe anxious or struggling with the topic, or like when these intrusive thoughts occur, or do you never get those at all? So, like throughout the day, I'm often, you know, I feel all the emotions. I feel. Lonely. I feel there's a weight on my shoulders. I feel like I have responsibilities for my employees, for my family. I get into social media、um, death scrolls, and I feel oh my god, I did that too about myself, and I hate myself for doing it. Not hate myself, but I feel a bit guilty. I'm getting better at it.、Um, so I feel all the emotions, I guess.、Mm. So it's like a sense of guilt for、like, even doing part of your job, almost, or like not achieving certain goals that you want to hit, basically, right?、Mm, well, I guess, like for example, like a scenario would be, let's say I finish this podcast and I'm a bit tired. I jump on Instagram to check something. But all of a sudden, I'm just scrolling through reels and I can't stop.、Yeah. And half an hour's gone by, and I'm like, man, like I shouldn't have done that. I feel bad, and then I sort of acknowledge that feeling. And I try to build up some encouragement and, and start getting back to work and try to get on with the day. So that that might be a scenario that might happen. That's not too bad because if you think about it, like that's how Instagram is designed. I guess like reassuring yourself that you do need breaks and you do deserve these breaks. Like desk scrolling is part of how Instagram is designed. You're really just playing into what the app is. That's、mm-hmm. part one. Part、mm-hmm. two, also understanding that you're basically doing market research. Like you're also involved in social media. So to a certain extent, like desk scrolling is part of the content creation podcast, like looking for creator journey. So、mm. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. But yeah, limiting your time, maybe setting alarms, like giving yourself that like responsibility and accountability, like set a time to end the desk scrolling, might be a good way to do it.、Mm. So you reckon? I guess the takeaway, me sort of putting my ego aside and wanting to learn、yeah. from you,、um, would be if I sort of get into that situation after the thirty minutes. Maybe rather than sort of feeling guilty, being like, "Hey, you know, I had this cool long podcast. I'm a bit exhausted, so this was a well deserved death scroll." And I also learned some things. It might have not actually been absorbed. It might have been one year out the other. But at least maybe subconsciously something stuck. And like, it's okay. Let's try rebuild some momentum and get through the rest of the day. Yeah. So it's like focusing on not beating yourself down. I don't know if it's rooted in self worth because it's like. It's almost feeling like you don't deserve a break, or you you, you like、mm-hmm. have to be productive. Like that's something that I personally struggle with, and I think it is tied to self worth.、Um, and low self worth is usually generated because of like childhood traumas、um, or situations where you feel like you don't deserve something. It, not always a hundred percent, but these are just like theories and hypotheticals.、Uh, but yeah, that's why I guess like. Free therapy for my stream. I always remind them it's like advice from your neighbor who's like maybe a close friend. Like it's like another perspective. Take it with a grain of salt. It's not going to be a hundred percent. Even a professional therapist is not going to be able to give you like the answer to life. You're going to have to filter out the knowledge and interpret it yourself and use it the way that you want to use it. And like you said, it's like putting the ego aside, just listening and seeing if you want to take it. I think every person needs to develop like a filter when they get advice on the internet. Because it's only relevant to you if you can filter out the things you that are irrelevant, you know. Because no one can understand yourself better than you, so you have to know what's best for yourself. Almost. These are all hypotheticals. I could be completely off. <laughs> so let's flip the mirror, and we'll sort of flip the scenarios, flip the tables, and I'll try to be the therapist. I'll try my best. Maybe I, w- I won't do a good job.、Um, you can ask me a question. I'll sort of give you my thoughts. And we can sort of mirror our responses to each other's feedbacks. So that's sort of the goal of this exercise. So,、um, yep,、yeah, uh, I'm here. It's 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 therapy Thursdays. How, how's everything, Toxic Bunny? Good. How is your weekday? How is your resting schedule? Were you able to like consistently feed yourself and drink water? I was. I was. I was able to do that. How's everything on on your end? 
it was good it was good i'm curious to hear more about i guess like were you struggling with any intruders oh, wait we're talking about you right we're flipping the tables so it's like it's the other way around now i'm gonna be we we're talking about you so you have to ask me a question like about you or about me um you know how i asked you a question and you gave me advice yeah so i want you to ask me a question and i'll give you advice so oh got it got it okay, okay yeah I got, it, got it, got it. and then we're gonna see the different responses well, i'm curious to see how you respond yeah but you know i might not give the best advice but i'll try my oh, best oh okay you want to give the advice got it got it got it yeah um my dog passed away <laughs> so i've been uh, avoidant style grieving um i talked to my therapist about that uh just like trying to get by staying productive i'm not as productive as, as i want to be but i also understand that like it's part of the grieving process. How long ago did your um, dog die? Uh, he passed away February 6th, so almost a month ago. But I was abroad uh, and with family and visiting grandparents, so he's been frozen this whole time. And I feel like I'm scared to go see him. <laughs> and then um, how did you find out about his death? Um, the sitter sent me a picture of him um and then told me he passed away did you know he was sort of getting old and about to die or did it come as, as a shock and you weren't expecting that yeah so he was four he was very healthy um and yeah it came as a shock because he's still a young dog and he would have only been in the sitter's care for two weeks and then a family friend could take over so it was like what four days into the trip and yeah i was in a lot of i was very shocked how many days did you have left from the trip? Three weeks. Oh, wow. The rest of the trip, yeah. It was in the beginning of the trip. Where was the trip or what was the trip? Um, I was just going to China to visit, like, grandparents yeah. uh, and family and my parents. And, like, I guess, like, you would have want like, the trip was, like, meant to be, like, this happy reunion with family and then you heard that four days in. How did that affect the, the rest of the trip? Honestly, the first week I basically couldn't like, you know, function properly. Um, I lost time, but like I am diagnosed with like PTSD. So I think I handle it in a way where it's like I have dealt with trauma in the past um, and like it's stepped up. So I, I do think that mental diagnoses can be viewed as like a debuff. But if used correctly, they can protect you sometimes, you know, in this specific situation. I only like shut down for a week and then I forced myself back up because like I haven't visited grandparents in four years because of COVID. Uh, the four years in which my dog was alive, I never came back to China. So I knew that I couldn't just go back immediately and going back wouldn't fix anything. I guess I was very realistic at the time. I was like very logical. Going back is not going to bring him back. It's not going to change anything. And like I'm already in China. I need to get what I came here to do done before I can go back home to see him because he wouldn't want me to go back and just like regret everything. You know what I mean? So went to the gatherings, saw my grandparents, tried to smile, um, you know, and, and it got easier as time went on, you know, like by the third week, it was a lot easier than the first. Uh, but like coming back is really hard because you got to go pick them up. You got to go look into like cremation burial so that's been pretty hard damn i gave you a hard one didn't i <laughs> you're just like oh gosh <laughs> prior to um going overseas how did not seeing your live dog for four weeks like the thought of that make you feel were you like sad to not see him or were you like oh it's fine i'll see him when i come back were you, were you gonna miss him because you were with him for four years straight um how were you feeling prior to leaving i was so nervous <laughs> Because, like, we're really bonded, and, like, I don't think I've ever been loved like he loved me. It's, like, unconditional love, right? The, the, the dog in the girl's 20s. No one talks about the dog in the girl's 20s. They always talk about the first boyfriend. No, 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 no. The first dog a girl gets in her 20s is the individual that teaches her about unconditional love. And, like, I truly believe that. Like, he taught me how to slowly love myself and to... I guess like take better care of myself because I was taking care of him. He can't communicate, right? So like I was so worried leaving him. Um, but it's like it's been four years, you know what I mean? My parents are just like, hey, when are you coming home? When are you coming to visit your grandparents? I was like, I think he's at a spot where he's really easy to take care of. 
I couldn't find family here to take care of him because I don't have that much family in like North America. Um, although we're all American, they prefer being in Asia. Uh, and then, so because I couldn't find family, I had to like resort to sitters. Friends, most of them are really busy. So I just didn't want to be a burden and I paid someone. I interviewed him. I went through the whole process. He met my dog and everything. Uh, but it just didn't turn out the way I thought it would. Um, yeah, lots of nerves, lots of fear. I travel a lot for like Instagram content and I almost always bring my dog. I think we've been apart for like 20 something days in the last 40, like, sorry, in the last four years. Uh, and I would prioritize collaborations where I could bring him and minimize collaborations I couldn't bring him. And then now that he sort of, when he passed away, I guess even when you came back from after that trip, how did it feel to not have that unconditional love and, and have that be missing from your life? It is horrible. I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like everything reminds you of him. It's like this emptiness in your stomach, right? It's probably just a normal part of grieving. Um, you just feel so empty. And it's like you expect him to be there on the car waiting. You expect him to claw at the door. You expect him to be there, but he's not. So it just feels really weird and uncomfortable. But you know where he is. You just don't really want to go see him yet because you're scared, I guess. That's probably all normal parts of grieving, so. I guess. Yeah, so that was literally a way you've been back. Yeah, you only came back from China. A day. <laughs> a day. I've had 24 hours <laughs> to process. And how's the last 24 hours being in back at home without him being? Honestly, I've let like the OC tendencies take over. Like I'm letting my mental diagnoses like take over because like the tr the ability to cope with trauma is better than what I can do by myself. The OC tendencies will help distract my mind. Like I, I truly believe that, you know, there's a lot of people in this world that are diagnosed that are still capable of functioning and doing a lot of things, even though they have a mental diagnosis. Um, and if you learn to use it to your benefit, I think it's helped me more than it's hurt, at least in times of great adversity. It's a pro, not a con. Like I unpacked, I cleaned because it helped with the obsession. <laughs> How do you feel or what do you feel like you actually need to do OCD aside? Like wh what is the right thing for you to do in this situation? Do you feel like from your heart or what do you think is the right thing to do OCD aside? I think finding answers. Because to me, that's how I grieve. Maybe it's not for everyone else. People on the internet are so judgy. They're like, you need to log off social media and grieve. I'm like, that's not how everyone grieves. Um, but I think I need to find answers. My brain maybe functions too much like a story. It needs to have a conclusion that I feel like is an ending or else it's I'm going to be stuck on this page. So finding answers, I guess. And how do you feel about the balance between finding answers and sort of just letting your OCD take over and just getting work done, being productive? Like, is it a pull gap? Can you do both at the same time? Or, or like, what's the relationship there between those two things? I think they can coexist because finding answers can be a task in itself. So it's not too bad. And do you think it'll be hard for you to sort of task in that, that task of finding answers into your already packed schedule? No, I think I can, I can probably manage. <laughs> I'm less productive than I used to be, but I'm forgiving myself for that. Yeah, because Ooh. there's only so much you can do after grieving. Oh gosh, wow, look at me trauma dumping on you. I hope that wasn't too heavy. <laughs> I think if I were to become a therapist, mm -hmm. I'd have to charge like $10,000 an hour. <laughs> you didn't enjoy it, did you? I enjoy doing that. I don't know if that makes sense. It's really weird. No, it takes like, I do it for like close friends and it, it takes a lot of listening, a lot of empathy, a lot of care, a lot of really wanting to listen to the other person and just putting yourself, your ego completely aside. <laughs> And you get better at listening. <laughs> They're not good at it. <laughs> so like, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not easy. But I feel like that's why I enjoy talking to, like I have friends that like 
from high school like they they're now therapists and it's oh, uh that's cool. but like during my talks it's just it's just me trying to gauge where, where they're at like for me to find a therapist i'd need to find someone that has more life experience than me has gone through more than me has like has been through the ups and downs of life so that they could really relate and sort of put themselves in my shoe because like the everyday therapist or listener wouldn't be able to do that and would probably give me some textbook answer or sort of just like guess what they're doing like for example in this scenario obviously two two points one when i when when we played it i sort of asked you a question i wanted to, I, I asked you specific questions whereas when we mirrored it you sort of just gave me a statement and was like this is what happened figure it out so that's one difference um, and the second thing I noticed is like, just based on where it was going, obviously you are like, hey, this is, I gave you a hard one, didn't I? I knew it was not a scenario where I would give advice. All I could do is listen and help unpack and, and see where you're at with it. And even if I did give advice, it wouldn't seal because I would be hit with buts. So like, but this, but that, because it's a unique scenario for you. And, and everyone thinks so like, all I could do is listen so obviously this is me unbreaking everything and it makes it look not sexy and not cool and not nice obviously the conversation we had was beautiful and this is me unpacking behind the scenes it's sort of me <laughs> revealing the, the how the magic is done so it definitely makes it sound less pretty um but yeah so i guess i think the difference between you and me is i do this every week and i also have a therapist the main difference is it's easier for me to open up because that's what i do on social media I think it is still possible to give me advice, but I'm better at telling you what my mental state is. I don't know if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm better at being honest with myself to a certain extent. Because mm -hmm. with you, I had to dig. So it's mm -hmm. like, let's say, what are you struggling with? You would tell me like a very like surface level answer. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't go deeper into it because you're also not used to that. You know what I mean? You're not used to be like unpacking what exactly you feel and what's the root of that cause. So I had to ask follow up questions, kind of dig deeper into understanding your past. Versus me, I just went, here is everything that happened. Here's what I'm struggling with. And it's still possible to give advice. But I do think that like, because I talked about, this is exactly what I talked about with my therapist today. Um, It is possible to give advice and guidance, but it's more so like, I do think it requires more education in psychology because it's not what an average person without that background can give. I don't know if that makes sense. It's harder versus like, I was just trying to unpack like what you were struggling with. Yeah. Uh, so I, the, is, that, is that helpful? Kind of. That's my interpretation. I think I have gotten really good at digging to a point you didn't know or feel like I was digging. I was using a shovel that was very soft, very gentle, and it didn't yeah. feel like it was digging at all. And I think it's rare. I only have met maybe one or two people that can do the same for me. I think as a result, I've always been, you know, I guess that's why I have a podcast. I always listen, but obviously I love to talk. If someone would want, like I have one or two friends where I can just talk forever. I love talking about myself, but obviously 99% of times I'm listening. You'd be a great live streamer then. <laughs> but live streamer, you need to be talking. Isn't it the opposite? Yeah. So you oh. say you love to talk. I feel oh. like you'd be a great live streamer. Because it's, yeah, podcast is listening, live streaming is talking. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Well, you're still listening, especially if you do free therapy nights, but like you're listening, but it, they also want to hear your opinion because mm. you're the only person capable of talking. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm. So I can't just sit there and be like, eh. you know, <laughs> I have to talk. <laughs> the reason why I only have one or two people that I can talk to is because mm. if I do a stream scenario, I'm just going to get a bunch of surface level questions. But I like getting dug deep and, and, and them sort of my friends really. You could lead it deep. Really? You could lead it. Throw, throw yeah, it yeah, 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 yeah. You could, you could lead it deep, you know? So, so let's, 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 <laughs> wait, let, let's role play this. Let's say you're, you're a chat and you're like, yeah. you're like, you type, hi, Andy. Oh, hi, Toxic Bunny. Uh-huh. And then like, what would you say in the chat next? 
Oh, you mean? Oh, okay. So let's say that I want to talk about like gender equality. I'll probably, I probably won't, but like that's a little too political. But I would just leave the conversation there and ask for opinions. We dig really deep into topics because maybe I'm feeling something when they start talking about it and people start adding to it. So you, as a streamer, lead the conversation the same way as a podcaster, you lead the questions, right? Like you lead where this goes. Oh, I think the two friends, I, I don't want to lead. I want to be able to just talk and follow and leading is tiring. Me listen, it, it's, it requires work. I don't want to work, but obviously 99% of the time I'm leading, I'm listening, I'm leading the conversation. But like, sometimes I just don't want to lead and I just want to sort of like answer and I want to sort of be led. Ah, I don't know what, what field that is. <laughs> I think streaming, you're still leading. Yeah. Like you're ultimately controlling the topics in which we're talking about. As well as the questions they ask, you could lead in a direction you think is better, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any reason, what's the main reason for like staying anonymous as a streamer? Like name wise, I guess. Is, is there, I'm just out of curiosity. I know this is a side yeah. tangent. I was just curious. I think it's just like for my parents' safety, as well as like I've had some toxic exes, so I don't really want to end up in a situation where I feel unsafe. That's where the PTSD came from, like mm -hmm. kind of abusive situation. So it was when I was younger. So it's like, ideally, I'm in a very public world, which probably will put me in danger, but it's put a lot of benefits out there. So it's to keep myself safe. So like one day, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say side note and we don't have to dig deep but i was just curious like why do you think you you might attract so many horrible exes or attract so many negative things or is that not the case oh i guess like i've had some very unhealthy relationships in the past because i would say that i'm pretty naive and like i love people really deep so i put myself in dangerous situations or i don't spot red flags fast enough so i guess i always had a very positive perspective of the world but the world showed me otherwise. Now I'm always scared. <laughs> so I was like, oh, the world is full of good people. And then I got, you know, and then I'm just like, okay, maybe, maybe I need to be more paranoid. Um, so I guess like just in case, you know, but I think one day if I have enough income to protect myself, like I'll buy like a Roddy, like a Rottweiler and a Doblerman and I'm going to be hella safe. Yeah. I don't care if my name, you know, goes out on the internet, but it's just like, in a situation where I can truly protect myself, then maybe. Makes sense. Anything, any, re this is the last two questions I usually always ask guests. Any recent discoveries that you've been implementing to your day-to-day -day life? Forgiving yourself, remembering to forgive yourself because I feel like that's something a lot of us don't do enough of. It's a lot of like, I need to do better. I need to, okay. Assuming you're not a narcissist and you don't have an ego problem. Okay. Assuming you don't have like ego problems and you're not a narcissist and you're not obsessed with yourself, like forgiving yourself because a lot of us feel like we're not doing enough. Um, we're not productive enough. We compare ourselves to other people. Uh, this is what my therapist taught me, but comparing to other people is part of evolution. It was to keep us safe. It was to keep us, I guess, like part of the pack because we're pack animals. Um, so we compare so that we're like everyone else. So we don't stand out and we don't like get kicked out by the herd um, and the pack. So comparing is a normal part of our daily lives, but we have to, because our society has changed, realize that we shouldn't push it too far. Like, although it's part of evolution and it's natural, I guess like learning to forgive yourself and appreciate yourself and to not like hurt yourself too much. Cause basically you're your worst enemy, right? As crazy as it sounds, if you can overcome yourself, you can overcome anything. Yeah. Understanding a lot of our functional functionalities are part of evolution, but learning how to work with them and I guess adjust to them is important. And Ian, um, goals are focused for the next six months. Become a bigger streamer. Work with more brands. I don't know. Very stereotypical stuff. <laughs> nice. Nice. Any questions for me before we wrap things up? Yeah, what's your favorite part of hosting podcasts other than listening? I think I really enjoy sort of a lot of my podcast majority of probably like 80% of it is sort of like talking to sort of experts in their fields. And I love sort of just hearing and learning from their process. I was hanging the clothes and I realized that like I've talked to like 120 experts or like people what? doing interesting things over the last two, three years. And that's really helped shape 
my current worldview, shape the answers to the questions I've had. And it's sort of like low-key a bit of therapy because each episode I'm talking, the questions are sort of pretty based and pretty like closely mirrors to what I'm going through at that certain time. Oh, that's hella cool. Any advice? Like maybe top three pieces of advice you've received. <laughs> top three advice I've received from others. Hmm. I guess I'm pretty, I think one is sort of being present. So like when you ask that question, my natural instincts was to dig back into the last 120 episodes and, and look at the best of the best. Oh. I've, I've learned somehow subconsciously through talking to so many people is that you know, you want to be present and, and I don't want to search that far back. And I just want to sort of think on top of my mind, what are the three things I learned? So that's number one. I think number two, recently like bringing on creators, it's cool to like see all these sort of creators that are, you know, everyone, they're all trying to figure life out. Everyone's sort of at that beginning phase where like, you know, it, it sort of contrasts all the experts I talk to, whether they're entrepreneurs, founders, or like they have a PhD or something, or they're kickboxer and they're, they've retired after like winning one or two world champions. Like talking to creators, it sort of allowed me to talk to people that are on a similar journey to where I'm at. And like, I found that I was like, huh, like through this, I'm able to sort of attract like-minded creators, entrepreneurs that are my age. And I think that's something I struggled with because in Sydney, in my radius, it's, it's, there's not many people doing what I'm doing. And this, the people who respond to my invites are people who, who probably see my stuff or they're like, oh, I sort of probably like this, this person I relate with. So like, I want to do their podcast. So I'm sort of naturally just attracting people that are similar and like-minded. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is sort of just having fun with it. Sort of like just having fun on the episodes, doing what I enjoy, taking it down paths that I find interesting. And the moment it sort of gets not fun or boring or, or, or like I don't feel it anymore, then, then, you know, it's, I guess that's the end and there's no need to force myself to- Oh my gosh, I'm me. sorry if I was boring. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, this is, this was not, that that was not directed at you. <laughs> I was like, okay, now I'm self-conscious. Was that um, boring? Oh. <laughs> to empathize with you, when you said I dress old, for the next 30 seconds, I was like self -conscious. Oh, I'm so sorry. You just dress more mature. I was like no. self-conscious for the next 30 seconds. And no. after I had to like psych myself out. No, I'm just trying to level with you that I feel the same way. So like, if you felt self-conscious, I felt self-conscious as well. You just look like an adult and I look like a child. That's my fault. <laughs> uh, uh. But um, those are the three things, I guess. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for sharing and thank you for taking the time to chat. It was really fun. No, thank you. Where can people find more of your content? Like what's the best place? Instagram, Twitch, we'll link everything below, but where are the best places? Probably Instagram and Twitch. I stream three times a week on Twitch, Tuesday, Thursday, Fridays, evenings. And then I post, I'm going to try to post daily on Instagram. <laughs> going to go back into the grind. Are you going to do more cosplay stuff? I know on, there's like a lot of cosplays. Is that, is that gone? Nice. Yes, it's a it's a personal hobby. Um, I don't think I'm a professional cosplayer. I've just been doing it for a while because it's fun. Do you watch anime? I do. I do. What's your favorite three? I know I was gonna Ooh. like be like I'm sorry for taking. I really time, like you know. Hunter X Hunter. I really like mm, Attack on Titan was really good. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm being very selective since you've given three. I'm like filtering through everything. You can do five if you can't choose. <laughs> Um, and I guess One Piece sits a bit lower than the next tier. And the next tier would include like Jujutsu Kaisen, um, Naruto, uh, Death Note, um, Full Metal Alchemist, all these, okay. all these ones. Um, and One Piece would sit slightly above. In you the got a lot of shonens in there. <laughs> really you got a lot of shonens. Yeah, I guess we grew up in a shonen era, I guess. I like yeah, like the young boy discovery error. Okay, that is so that that makes sense. No, okay. <laughs> definitely oh, not okay. psychoanalyzing you. If I were to like be more, I guess less boyish. I really like all the Studio Ghibli movies. I loved okay, uh, fair. Yeah, Princess yeah, yeah. Mononoke. I, I love that's art. I loved the 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 Howling Castle, castling in the how. I don't know. I, I loved that 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 new movie of um, uh, Wolf Children. 
That was amazing. Uh, I can watch that one. Oh, you gotta. Wolf Children, I Wolf think. Children? Oh, God, I'm writing it down. <laughs> you gotta watch it. That one's really good. And Your Name. Your Name was really good. Um, but back to the shonen, I guess I, I forgot to add in, um, um, what's that? What's that guy that fights demons? Oh, I forgot. He wears green. Demon Slayer. Demon Slayer, yeah. But that's da, 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 that one. Hey, that was your, that your Name? The movie Your Name? Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, I really liked that. That was really good. So that's the the non shonen yeah. um non. No, there's nothing wrong with liking shonen. It's like it's good. Right, like I like a lot of shonen. Your turn. Um, I feel oh, like I'm gonna get cancelled if you include this in the podcast. I'm gonna get cancelled. Uh, okay, I gotta think about this. You see, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard because then they're gonna psychoanalyze your anime choices. It's a reflection. They're gonna they're gonna judge us. It's a you know it's true. Who you are. <laughs> Death Note, I really like Death Note. My Hero Academia. Oh! I, I, I watched a bit of that, but okay. Oh my god, that's Attack so... on Titans. Oh my god, My Hero Academia is so you. Link Click. It's a, it's a recent one. I'm a photographer, so I like that one. Uh, that's top three. I think everything else is like good, but it's like... I really like season one of... um. What's that game? What's that anime where you go into a game and then they're stuck in a game? Sword Art Online. Yeah, I really love season one. I, I broke off my headphones. Uh, I love Sword Art Online. Wait, wait. Okay, that's 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 there too. You're right. You're right. That I forgot about that one. Sword Art Online is really good. I did you see that? I was like, um, yeah, it's really good. Did you play Maple Story when you're younger? That game Maple Story. No, I played yeah. Starcraft. Oh wow. It's a nerd. Uh, World of Warcraft. Wow. Hearthstone. What else? Did you play um? Wait, is World of Warcraft the RPG one or the building one? The uh, it's like raids, like Mythic and. World of Warcraft. You know how there was like there was Warcraft and World of Warcraft. Oh, World of Warcraft. It was the the one with like groups of people fighting a big monster. <laughs> That's not the best way to describe it. Um, it's like a yeah. But Warcraft is more similar to Starcraft, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. I never got into yeah, yeah. I never got into like Maple Story though. I know you brought up Maple Story, but I know a lot of people did play. It. It's more similar, yeah. Starcraft and Warcraft. Mm. That's super cool. Yeah, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. It was cool, sort of listening to your journey, um, and I can really see that you sort of do want to sort of help others and and go through this and sort of pass on all your all, all your lessons. So that's really cool. I think yeah, it's like... too gatekeepy. <laughs> this industry is too gatekeepy. Yeah. And you have to be pretty talented to sort of make this work. Like you working in tech, you going through that thing. So, so you're a pretty talented, driven individual. I'm uh, just mentally ill. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, like I, I guess condolences on the passing away of your dog. It's I'm I'm surprised that this is your first day back. Your first day back. You spent it, so thank you for your time today. I know it can't really, and like you're probably replying to the email when, like, after knowing a dog died. So I totally did not know, but um, no, but... you're fine, you're fine. You're fucking really, it's not your fault. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, that's another episode of the podcast. Hopefully, you guys enjoy that. That was this was a pretty fun episode. Please let me know your thoughts, and I'll see you guys next week on another episode. Peace. <laughs>